Dr. Rubin, would you like to start this webinar? Absolutely. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Just to give you a little bit of background, what you have tonight is a, a great set of panelists. And those panelists um, and what you're about to see really originated, originated from a great idea from a member of the Human Resources Commission, Dr. Mayer. And I did um, ask that our commission, as one of our goals, think about different ways to talk about and think about our workforce. And I think that how we teach and learn is one of those extensions of how we prepare our workforce um, as they go forward. So that's where this came from. I think you're going to hear a great set of talks tonight. In fact, I know you're going to hear a great set of talks tonight. Uh, just a few thank yous. I'd like to thank the ACR for hosting. Um, I'd like to thank our ACR staff. And just as background, I am the chair of the ACR Human Resources Commission. And we also have as one of our sponsors who is working very closely with us and also has led the way forward for us, Dr. Diet, who is the chair of the Commission on Publications and Lifelong Learning. And I'd like to introduce her uh, for a few comments right now as well. Okay, thank you, Dr. Rubin. And hello, everyone. I am excited and honored to co-sponsor this webinar. And the idea of kind of a specific moving from survive to thrive stemmed from a conversation that Dr. Harpady and I had a while ago. We were talking, we were actually kind of um, sharing our experiences during the pandemic and as educators going back to March. And starting in March, and many of you will remember this, is you, it, we went overnight from teaching in person to having to scramble to survive by teaching virtual in different ways that we have never had never done before. Um, since then, we've learned, tweaked things a little bit. We've learned along the way. We've shared things along the way. And where this conversation ended with, um, we started talking about, so what would we take moving forward, which is the theme of today's um, webinar. So I'd like to thank you also for joining us. And next, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Mayer. Thank you very much and uh, welcome again. And as you can see from our slides that our speakers today range widely all the way from the trainees or recent trainees to experienced renowned educators so that we can share a broad experience and a broad dialogue between the learners and the teachers. And so with no further ado, I'd like to introduce my co-moderator, Dr. Petra Lewis, Professor of Radiology and OBGYN at Dartmouth. Thank you very much, Nina. Um, could you, Jeremy, could you please just go to the housekeeping slide quickly so I can make sure that everyone's seen. Welcome everyone and um, I greatly appreciate the fact that for some of you like us on the East Coast, it's almost our bedtime. Um, staying up for this and we hope it's going to be useful to you. So just a couple of quick things. Uh, we are not using the raise hand function, so please don't uh, try using that. And also, please don't put messages into the chat. We will be monitoring the Q&A function, and we will try and get through as many questions as we can at the end of the lectures. The lectures have all been pre-recorded so that we didn't have any technical glitches in the middle of it. So put in a Q&A. Um, we'll review them as we go along. We'll try and get to as many as possible by the end. So uh, let's not waste any more of your time here and we'll get straight on and show you the talks, starting with Dr. Bettys. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Harpreet Beatty. I'm a clinical associate professor of radiology and vice chair of education at BU. And it's my pleasure to discuss radiology education, moving from recreating the past to designing the future. I'd like to thank Dr. Rubin and Diet, Lewis and Mayer for the invitation to speak today. Nothing to disclose. And our two quick goals are recognizing the strengths and limitations of the pre-COVID and COVID era teaching and discuss ways to leverage the strengths of both eras to create new and innovative ways of teaching. So how do we move from survive to thrive? It was very much a survival posture uh, during COVID, damage control education. I think we've learned a tremendous amount and what can we learn and how can we move forward in a thrive posture to leverage the strengths of the uh, things that we learned in COVID. So that's the theme of today's uh, talk in session. 
In the pre-COVID era, there were certain strengths, right? This was lecturing to our learners in person. It was a familiar model. Uh, things were synchronous and there was a live audience and there was very little tech to learn. You just need to plug in your laptop or your thumb drive. And the teachers felt very reassured that they were covering the content because if I gave you a talk on temporal bone, I pretty much assume you understood it. The limitations of that, of course, is it's a passive learning model and there's no real proof of learning. Very seldom did a lecturer check for your understanding of the talk while they were giving it. Um, it was limited to local faculty and all conferences were limited by the in-person experience. So multidisciplinary conferences, interesting case conferences, tumor boards, you had to be there to benefit from them. Things like AIRP, board reviews also had to be there to benefit from them. So then we entered COVID, which was very much damage control and had major impacts on the clinical workflow, enormous drop in clinical volume, which sort of hurt the resident's clinical experience and many residents were redeployed. And then from the education side, Everything became remote, remote lectures, remote rotations for residents and medical students. Social media became a big player in education. A lot of societies stepped up, right? So the APDR had the National Virtual Noon Conference. Nancy Pfefferman uh, created a uh, core curriculum video series from the AUR, uh, the ACR. AIRP stepped up and made it a remote experience. So really amazing endeavors from so many sides. Uh, and they did synchronous and asynchronous teaching, so very much damage control. And there's a lot of tools we came to know, right? There was something uh, for conferencing called Zoom, maybe you guys have heard of it, um, became uh, the front runner uh, in, in conferencing and the remote experience. Some people use things like Teams and WebEx. For the virtual readouts, again, people still use Zoom, and we were using other things like Horos and Paxbin to create a virtual experience many times for the medical students and for classroom tools to make things more interactive. Everybody became more familiar with recording lectures to make things more interactive. They used things like Kahoot and Poll Everywhere and Aquifer, things like that. So we do know there was a tremendous amount of content created during the COVID era. Amazing content by some of the most renowned radiologists around the world. So we're very, very grateful for that. The other thing we're grateful for is the fact that it was all free. But now it needs to be organized and structured in a way that we can create maybe a new type of curriculum that leverages the online uh, content that was created with other things. So now what? We really can't go back to the old way it was. It was a very passive environment. Nobody really benefited from that from a learning standpoint. We've learned that remote teaching can be very effective in many ways, and learners prefer some degree of remote learning. Uh, they can uh, use recorded lectures and play them back at speeds that they want. They can review them over and over again if they're away. Uh, they still have the opportunity to learn. And we also learned that teachers and speakers appreciate the convenience to some degree of remote learning. So uh, there are a lot of things we can take away. Can we take the strengths from the pre-COVID era and the COVID era to create something new? That would be the goal. We know that interactive experience creates motivation. So can we say that the in-person experience should not include passive learning or should limit passive learning? Passive learning can happen on your own time now. And we can also say the in-person experience must be interactive and engaging. Again, this motivates people. It uh, helps with recall and understanding. So some ideas, multi-institutional collaboration. So the virtual platform has essentially allowed us to lecture remotely uh, all around the world. So can you have virtual grand round speakers and virtual visiting professors and virtual board reviews? You can do all these things seamlessly now and people are getting a more, higher level of comfort with them. Not only can you invite somebody, but that single speaker can also uh, lecture at multiple institutions at one time. And I think this is especially important for virtual visiting professors. You can tremendously increase the amount of impact you have when you are lecturing at multiple institutions at once. It saves travel time and uh, personal time on, 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 on a lot of those ways. And the visiting professor, especially a junior level visiting professor, can make a greater impact and build a CV in an academic career uh, with the conveniences of remote lecturing. From the department standpoint, you get to learn from subject matter experts uh, that you may not have in your department. And you really, the budgets um, are tight and you save money on flying people out and putting them up in hotels and that whole thing. A lot of that, believe me, was fun. But um, with budgets tight, I think the department benefits from the virtual experience also. You also get to leverage faculty outside of your department to fill content gaps. So if you don't have a, 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 a subject matter expert on informatics or healthcare policy or a, a global initiative or AI, you can get these uh, speakers even speaking remotely and fill those content gaps. 
one of the other very important things is the international community. So we can invite international uh, lectures. The, you know, two weeks ago we had one of the most prominent neuroradiologists in Japan speak to our neuro division. That would have been very difficult to organize otherwise. But we can leverage the expertise around the globe now, and we can also lecture around the globe, which in my opinion is so important for educational equity. So there are low-resource countries and low-resource departments, and they want to take as good care of their patient population as we do, and now we can provide them with our knowledge to help them do that. To me, is a super important thing. Next, interactive sessions. So how do we make things more interactive? Clearly, the flipped classroom uh, is a very popular piece now. Uh, people are learning uh, the passive content at home, and you can make the in-person sessions much more interactive. Uh, you can use audience response and things like that. And you can reinforce the learning that they did at home or the independent learning that they did at home to check for understanding in the in-person sessions. And you can take a deeper dive into the material. You can promote situational learning and critical thinking and problem solving. And now, rather than the passive learning piece, you make it active when you're with them and you can capture their attention and create emotion and energy. One really fun thing that we did at BU was when Zoom bombing became an issue from a security standpoint, I had a play on Zoom bombing and I would invite the first author or the speaker of the uh, article that I assigned in journal club. So imagine, you know, we would have a journal club on Monday, I would assign uh, an article on the spine and I would actually have the author of the article Zoom bombed the journal club and I'd say, hey, who is this person that just signed in? It happened to be Dr. Adam Flanders from Jefferson and they had such a great discussion with Dr. Flanders on his article and getting his opinion on uh, a space that he has full command of. We had so many amazing neuroradiologists Zoom bomb our journal clubs uh, during the COVID era and it was a really fun experience, not only for the residents, but I think uh, the speakers really enjoyed it too. Another idea you could do is a flipped visiting professor. So it is great to have the energy of a visiting professor in your department. If we considered the fact that we could, as a visiting professor, give you our talk ahead of time, so the passive learning piece is already done before we visit the department, now the visiting professor could potentially make a much more interactive and engaging experience with the learners and the department when they're visiting. Uh, I think that would be uh, a better use of everybody's time in so many ways. Uh, visiting professors would have to be willing to give content before they got there, but if the residents and the department watch the content, the actual experience of the professor, I think, would be um, much more engaging and interactive, so something to consider. And finally, what does the future hold for us? I think if we can create a new and innovative way to teach using the combination of asynchronous and synchronous, online learning and in-person sessions, flip classrooms, we can create something really amazing. I think the future also holds things like personalized or precision education, um, which we can use with AI potentially. I think the future holds a, a space for gaming. There's certainly AR and VR that many medical students and technology companies are trying to leverage in the, in the education space. And we must push for innovation beyond lecture creation. Everybody's created the lectures, it's time to go to a thrive uh, posture in which we can create something new and exciting. So that's it. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to contact me through the email, or you can follow me at Twitter at Hart Beatty. And uh, it was great um, to be part of the session and uh, enjoy the rest of the webinar. Hi, everybody. My name is Yasha Gupta, and today we will be discussing virtual radiology education in the COVID-19 and post-COVID-19 era. In my opinion, this really comes down to one thing, and that is engagement. Well, what is engagement? The dictionary definition of engagement is to participate or to become involved in. And I think this is really a great definition of what it means to be an effective educator. This is when you have your learners participating in your lecture material and becoming involved in the actual material that you are trying to teach them. What that really comes down to is an effective two-way communication. That means that you're getting feedback from them just as you are talking to them and you're starting to understand where their weaknesses may be, you know, what types of questions they may have, and you're able to discuss that during your lecture. Well, unfortunately, because of virtual learning, this two-way communication really gets lost. And we are stuck with this one-way communication where you are just talking into a camera, much like I am right now, and you have no way of knowing whether your learners are 
agreeing with what you are saying, understanding the material, because you no longer can see their faces. You no longer hear them saying, I have a question or anything like that. And this two-way communication is completely lost. Well, hopefully some of the methods that I'm about to show you can help you regain that two-way communication. The first method is called the flipped classroom. And this is essentially where you send out the material that you would originally have lectured on in advance of the lecture and have the material, have the residents review the material on their own time. So for example, sending out book chapters, sending out PDFs of the lecture you are going to give or even pre-recording a lecture for them. That way, when it comes time for the lecture time, you can actually spend that time going over questions that residents came across and had difficulty with. You can even ask them questions and maybe do like a quiz type of thing, or you could even show them cases and do cases in a round robin style. These are all more effective ways than just, you know, giving a lecture to a large group of people, because I feel like in those situations, you really lose that two-way communication. In this way, the residents can speak up, ask questions, or you could even ask them to send in questions ahead of time. And this way you have an idea of what the weaknesses are and what confusing points are and tailor the education to each group of residents. Another method of engagement is using polls and games. And really what this means is that you can send out multiple choice questions to a large group of people, your entire audience, and see what types of things your learners are understanding or not understanding just by the questions that you're asking. You can use this to do a pretest, for example, and see what may potentially be confusing as you approach different topics in your lecture. You can use it as a post test to see if, um, people actually learned whatever it is that you were teaching that day. And my personal favorite is just multiple questions or cases spread throughout the lecture to make sure that everyone in the audience is remaining engaged. They are understanding what you are saying. They're listening to the topics that you're discussing. And this way you can really understand what level the learners are at. As I mentioned earlier, this really reestablishes the two-way communication because if you notice that a large number of people are not understanding of a certain topic, you can of course expand on that, spend a little extra time, and this way it would emulate you know, a classroom discussion. Another advantage is that it allows the users to remain anonymous. So whether um, residents or fellows or all learners, you know, they may not feel comfortable speaking up in a large group of people. They may not want to unmute themselves or turn on their camera for whatever reason. And this helps you understand like what, what they are thinking without having to ask anyone to do that. So this is a really effective way, especially in large groups of people to, rem to keep everyone engaged and to see where everybody is throughout your talk. Zoom has a capability within their software for you to do polls. And there's also other apps called Poll Everywhere, which allows you to do a poll that you can connect to a cell phone. And so they can answer just like they would be texting somebody. And then of course there are games like Kahoot, which allow you to rack up points as you um, answer questions and you get extra points for doing it faster or and you lose points for doing it slower. And that can also be kind of a fun challenge for residents or anyone to um, take part in. And finally, Using smaller groups is always an advantage. I really believe that this is true. Um, use breakout sessions whenever you can. If you're moderating a large session, always think about using breakout rooms because people are more comfortable speaking up and turning their camera on in front of a smaller group of people rather than a large group of people. The small things also do matter when you're engaging with learners, for example, keeping your camera on so they can see you and your facial expressions. This is very important. And also encourage the residents or learners to keep their cameras on whenever possible. Although I understand that this reduces um, your bandwidth, so it may not always be possible. And of course, do things that you would do in normal life. Smile, gesticulate, you know, you're always able to use your hands and emphasize the point doing this. And if they can see your face, it makes it 10 times better. Hopefully this was helpful. I hope that these tips and tricks were also of utility for you. And with that, I will end my talk. Thank you so much for listening. And you can find me at Yashagupta MD if you do have any further questions or comments or suggestions for me, I would really appreciate that. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jennifer Huang. I'm a second year diagnostic radiology resident at Vanderbilt University. Today, I'll provide a brief presentation on how residents can contribute to the new normal learning environment. We'll go over seven practical tips on how residents can do this. So we'll just jump right in and get started with tip number one, which is that patience is a virtue, especially during a pandemic. We all know that as Bob Dylan likes to put it, the times are a change in, and because of that, 
we all have to be a little bit more flexible and patient in our daily routines. Whether you're waiting in line for toilet paper at a supermarket or waiting for technical difficulties on a Zoom lecture, acknowledge that we're in a constantly changing environment and try to be patient because we're all ultimately working towards the same goals. Practical tip number two, share cases with your co-residents to help promote resident to resident learning at the workstation. While on a recent night shift as the junior caller, my upper level took a few seconds out of his night to show me this traumagram he was reading. He made me differentiate this limbus vertebrae from this fracture, pointing out that the limbus vertebrae results from extrusion of the nucleus pulposus. He also showed me the reason we prone in this 75 year old male presenting to the ER with gross hematuria to find this immobile irregular mass adjacent to the right ureteral orifice, distinguishing it from clot or to tell me his protocol for dealing with this acute aortic injury on an inpatient that was on his list of studies for preliminary review. I learned all of this in just one night on, it, on with him, and you can bet I won't forget these. Because rather than just reading about it amongst this block of words like this in a textbook, I now have a context in which to place these findings, which as we know, helps learners retain information more easily. To make things even easier, our new PAC system has a chat function that allows for us to share cases with people who are offline at the time. So sharing cases is literally right at our fingertips. So check to see what tools are available at your institution and remember to share cases with your co-residents. Every day, there are hundreds of great learning cases and the more people that get a chance to see them, the better for our trainees as a whole and for our patients. Practical tip number three, some of this new technology may be alien to your attending and other colleagues. If that's the case, help them out by giving them useful tips that you've learned. After all, medicine, including radiology, is a team sport. You might have some extra knowledge about how to use Poll Everywhere to create more engaging presentations or to create polls within Zoom. So whether you're using Poll Everywhere as an audience response system or Microsoft Teams or WebEx, or Zoom, it's always helpful to share and learn more tips. Practical tip number four, don't try to make your attending guess what you want to learn like in a game of charades. Your attending needs to know what you're trying to learn for the day. So communicate your goals and ask questions. Whether that's to see as many coronavirus cases as you can in a day, or whether it's to hone your expertise in identifying HCC on MRI. Whatever your goals are, make sure you and your attending are on the same page. Practical tip number five, attend virtual conferences. I remember back in the day, whenever I wanted to get onto the internet at home to talk to my two friends online, I'd get this pop-up and it would make this beep beep boop noise while something about my computer connected to my home phone landline. Now we have these fancy things that do basically everything that nearly everyone knows how to use. So remember to take advantage of all this technology. For example, this is straight from the RSNA website for its 2020 annual meeting. And you can see that for members in training who are RSNA members, you can register for the 2020 annual meeting for free. And just in case you were worried about your RSNA membership, that's also free. So take advantage of these huge savings now while you're a resident. In addition, for those of you on social media, there are plenty of great cases that are being shared by your colleagues around the world. So you can always check those out. And finally, there's a huge Google document curated by the ACR resident fellow section that provides links to various websites and resources split by specialty. This is just the first page of them. So there's a whole lot more than just this. Take advantage of all this outstanding technology and of all of your outstanding colleagues around the world by participating in virtual lectures when you can. Practical tip number six, don't be like this guy and take advantage of teaching opportunities. Your medical students might not be this excited to be there, but they definitely wanna learn as much as they can from you so that they can take great care of their own patients. So be like Socrates and teach your medical students and other learners at the workstation or in lecture. It's a great way to learn and to identify what you don't know as well. And finally, practical tip number seven, don't forget to treat yourself and others around you. 
look around for those colleagues of yours waving yellow or red flags, displaying warning signs that there might be something else going on. Take care of yourself and others and speak up for your friends and coworkers. So to recap on seven tips to help residents contribute to this new learning environment. Number one, be patient. Recognize that times are changing and that we're all trying to figure this out together. Number two, share cases with your co-residents. I'm sure you've seen a lot of awesome cases that your co-residents would benefit from also. Number three, help your colleagues with new technology. Give them tips that you've learned to help them become even better radiologists and educators. Number four, communicate your goals with the attending you're working with so they'll know what you want to focus on and ask questions. Number five, attend virtual conferences. There are so many right now and most are completely free. So attend what you can to maximize your learning. Number six, take advantage of teaching opportunities when they arise because you're not only helping your learner, you're also solidifying your own knowledge. And last but not least, number seven, always remember to take care of yourself and others. This is a very stressful time for a lot of people. So be on the lookout for those around you that may need a little bit of a boost. Thank you so much for your attention. Here's my contact information. I'm always happy to answer any questions that you might have or to discuss anything else education related, so feel free to reach out. Hi, I'm Hina Said, Assistant Professor of Radiation Oncology at Medical College of Wisconsin. Today, I will provide a brief presentation on how trainees can optimize their interactions with the patients in the new environment. Not surprisingly, the same set of skills can be helpful for a flourishing trainee educator relationship as well. So let's dive in. Although the experience of being with the patient and faculty in room and witnessing the nuances of the conversation is priceless, the COVID-19 pandemic caused a disruption in clinical experience, resulting in a restructuring of resident duties. Trainees on site were minimized, while those on research rotations were maximized. Trainee exposure to patients was limited, especially those on the COVID floors and those with COVID undergoing treatment in the clinic. So with this, how can we optimize patient-resident training or interactions and along the same lines, resident-educator relationship? High creativity, resilience, and innovation has resulted in several adaptations. The number of trainees on site was able to be increased by putting up signs indicating maximum occupancy in areas, by physically distancing working stations, and ensuring proper safety equipment, PPE, sanitizers, wipes. Use of e-consoles has been encouraged with data showing that 22 specialties participate in it. 85% of e-consoles saved patient trips to specialty clinics. E-consoles serves to increase efficiency and reduce cost, not only in radiation oncology, but also in radiology specialties like IR. Introduce and maintain remote treatment planning and documentation capabilities. This is nothing new for radiology, but for radiation oncology, the complexity of tasks involved from contouring to planning to approving, the teamwork needed and the rapid back and forth communication amongst the attendings, residents, the osimetrists who developed the plan, the physicists, and navigation of the plan through different stages posed several challenges initially, and overcoming these have been a significant improvement. It provides a great opportunity to involve the residents in treatment planning as well as educating them about the nuances of a plan. By saving contours in the different names or sessions and remotely viewing them or attendings holding a live session and highlighting the pertinent aspects or residents looking at the images from daily radiation, the opportunities including remote chart rounds and remote contour rounds are endless. So moving to the patients now, how do we continually improve this component of care delivery in current environment? We do this by examining the virtual competencies fundamental to the art of telemedicine. As the industry continues to evolve and non-traditional visits increase, the success of patient experience will become intrinsically linked to areas like website manner. According to New York Times, the simple things a doctor says and does to connect with patients can make a difference for health outcomes. Website manners are fundamental in establishing an intimate connection with the patient. So how do we do it? 
Familiarize yourself with technology. A challenge is aligning both technology and physicians to develop a satisfactory offering to patients, regulators, and executives in an ever-changing telehealth landscape, oftentimes requiring a steep learning curve. Create a personal action plan for troubleshooting and overcoming technical challenges in a telemedicine encounter. Set the stage with patients for digital communication, paying attention to lighting, presentation, speech, and body language. Needless to say, the manner in which a physician communicates information to a patient is as important as the information being communicated. Clinicians should demonstrate effective and concrete communication with patients in a virtual space. This includes nonverbal aspects as well that comprise a whopping 65% of the communication. Establish a relationship with the patient. Reduce communication speed to ensure clarity. Be more conscious of the warmth of opening and closing greetings. Starting with a smile goes a long way. At the beginning of the appointment, confirm that the patient can hear and see you clearly. Allow for an extra pause after the patient speaks to ensure they have completed their sentence to avoid interruptions. Explain when you have to look away from the patient to reference the electronic health record or other documents. Convey empathy through language. Look at the camera rather than screen to maintain eye contact with the patient. Use screen sharing technology to convey imaging and diagnostic findings. Prepare to perform a physical exam virtually. Use a closing checklist that includes a summary of the plan. Reinforce any provider actions, such as calling in a prescription, labs, etc. Reinforce any actions that the patient will take, such as increasing activity, changing diet, and complying with medications. Provide guidance on what to watch for should a problem worsen, and offer instructions for follow-up questions or concerns. The skills mentioned to optimize website manners also allows us to take care of each other as colleagues, as well as to be more effective in the teaching environment. Moving forward is typically associated with growing pains and quality decline. However, these can be avoided or minimized. Feedback from both patients and trainees is key to improving the experience. So that's it for now. Please feel free to contact me for any questions or feedback. Hello everyone. My name is Judy Gaddy. I am a pediatric neuroradiologist at Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. Today I will be spending the next few minutes with you speaking about how to optimize the hybrid learning experience. Now today more than ever, there are a plethora of free online radiology educational resources. These include articles, many YouTube videos, whether those be from societies, institutions, or personal, society webinars such as this one with CME credit. There's a ton of free educational content on Twitter, including radiology cases of the day or cases of the week. There have been multiple tweet chats, including those to discuss how to approach radiology education during the pandemic. Multiple radiology societies have curriculums that you can follow. And again, now more than ever, there are many institutional and personal websites for radiology educational content. This was a list of free open access radiology resources that was created by the ACR resident fellow section during the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. This was created to have a list of all of the available content for trainees all across the world. And you can see here, I just took a snippet of the neuroradiology head and neck imaging section. And in this section alone, there's a lot of content. There's institutional and personal YouTube videos and websites. Here at the bottom, you can see there's multiple cases of the day and cases of the week, many of which are on Twitter. So a lot of content that can be overwhelming for both us as faculty and trainees. So how do we approach blended learning? First of all, what is blended learning? Blended learning is the junction of asynchronous and synchronous learning. So asynchronous learning being what the trainee has done before their time with you, whether that synchronous time is virtual or in-person. 
the best way to do this is to have structure. And the way to have structure in this context would be a curriculum. As I just previously mentioned, many radiology societies have curriculums that are free and that you can follow. Or your own department or division may have a separate curriculum that has been used in the past and has been vetted. So I wanted to show you some examples of asynchronous learning because maybe not everyone is familiar with this. First, I went to the ASNR website where there are several different curriculums. There's an R1 to R3 curriculum, an R4, and then a fellowship curriculum. This is an example from the R4 curriculum, which includes everything from R1 to R3 plus the addition for R4. I went to the section of, for 10, which is congenital and developmental. And here for this first example, if we look at A, this curriculum says, know some of the childhood causes of hydrocephalus. So if we want to have some asynchronous learning connected to this curriculum, we need to find learning that matches up with this topic. So I went to the ASNR Education Connection, which is where you can find resources, mainly articles and videos. And some of the videos are from previously recorded ASNR meetings. This example I found was a neurographics article titled Endoscopic Third Ventriculostomy, a discussion and pictorial review. So I thought this would be a good article for a trainee to read to understand endoscopic third ventriculostomy, which ties back to a cause of hydrocephalus, which often in this case is aqueductal stenosis. So you would tie this asynchronous learning of this article to the curriculum and have your trainee do this before their time with you. Another example, if we again go back to the title of hydrocephalus, we could also use a case of the week. This is the ASPNR case of the week that I found from September 2019, which was a fetal MRI referral for ventriculomegaly. So you can have the trainee go to this case of the week, which is online on a website, but also on various forms of social media and review this case in order for them to further understand hydrocephalus. Another example would be if we go to C, which is the topic of brain malformations, sulcation, and migrational anomalies. Here I went to radiographics and found a relevant article titled Prenatal Ultrasound and MRI Findings of Liz Encephaly, Review of Fetal Cerebral Sulcal Development. So again, this was an article that we could have the trainees read to meet this topic for the curriculum before their assigned time with us. So now that the trainee has performed the asynchronous learning, hopefully, how do we blend this into the synchronous learning? So some ideas that I had were to tie it into the didactic lecture or cases that you're giving, whatever that may be. One way to do this would be to have questions related to the asynchronous assignment. So again, if we're still in the virtual environment, we could have poll questions that tie back to the assignment of whether it being the article or the case of the week that the trainee should have read. We could also use images from the article or from the cases and give reference back to that asynchronous learning during our time with the trainees. Another way to approach this would be to save time for discussion. You could do this by having an assigned trainee give you a quick summary. So they could give you a quick summary of the case or of the assigned article, or you could have specific discussion questions that you ask all of the trainees, depending on the size of your group, to tie back into the asynchronous learning. So I'm sure many of us by this point are probably very familiar with how to make virtual learning more interactive. And I know some of these topics will be covered during this webinar. However, I just wanted to again give some examples and make the point that we do need to try to make this virtual learning more interactive so that it's more fun for all of us. This can be done various ways using poll software, which I've included here on the left. You can do polls in Zoom, Poll Everywhere, Kahoot, and RSNA Diagnosis Live, and I'm sure there's many other poll software. You can also do this using what are called heat maps where you can have an image 
and have the trainees select an area of interest or wherever they think their area of abnormality is. And then specifically in Zoom, which I'm most familiar with, you could have the trainee annotate, you could use the whiteboard function or break the trainees into breakout rooms depending on the size of the group. But what about after the pandemic and we hopefully go back to in-person learning, but we also need it to be interactive. You can still do what I just discussed from the virtual learning experience of making things more interactive with polls and breakout rooms and such, but you also get the added benefit of being in person and you could even break your trainees into teams or groups. And one way to do this would be gamification. I know several institutions have done things such as broken up their residency program into groups, say through Game of Thrones and have each group be a house. You could do that just to make things more interactive and more fun for, again, everyone, including the faculty and the trainees. So one thing that I wanted to end with is that I think what a lot of us have learned from the pandemic is that we need to keep the discussion going. We need to have a connection and this is easier now more than ever. You can see here on the left, this is the Discord logo. This is basically like an online server for people to do many things, including interacting via chat and other ways. There's specifically one now called Rad Discord, which an R4 resident, Grace Zhu, recently created that you can get access to. If you need access, just let me or Grace know. And then Twitter is always available for lots of discussion. Again, now more than ever, there's virtual society meetings, even though we can't be in person right now. Many of these society meetings have live question and answer sessions at the end of the recorded lectures, or even some of them have live lectures. And then there's also mobile apps such as WhatsApp, Telegram, GroupMe, where we can keep discussions going and talking about interesting radiology cases. And then lastly, inter-institutional lectures and research, which I know Dr. Beatty will cover more in depth with you, but something I think is very important today. So my summary for you is that interaction during virtual lectures is so important to keep everyone awake, alert, and having fun. Yes, there's an overwhelming amount of free online radiology educational resources. And that's why we need to have structure for our trainees and for ourselves, such as using a curriculum, whether that be one from a society or our own. Once we have asynchronous learning assigned to our trainees, we need to make sure that we follow up on that during our time with them and tie it all in together. And please keep the discussion going, whether it be online or offline. I hope this has been helpful for you. Thank you for spending these few minutes with me. I'm always available for any questions or comments. You can email me here or you can always find me on Twitter. Thank you and take care and stay safe. Thank you very much, Dr. Gad, and thank you to the rest of our speakers. Uh, we're going to take some questions and answers here. So uh, please, anybody in the audience, um, type a question into the Q&A and we'll get to it. We also have some um, questions prepared that we thought would um, interest you. Um, before we start with the Q&A, actually, I have a question for Dr. Betty. Um, you know, Harp, I'm very excited by this whole multi-institutional visiting professor thing. And I, I know that we've sort of dabbled in this in a, a small way up um, between our institutions previously a few years ago, long before COVID. Um, and I think this is really the time to invigorate this. Visiting professors are very expensive um, and their time is very precious and sharing them from local institutions seems to make a lot of sense. But how do you think we should initiate this? Um, I think, you know, it takes buy-in. I would start with regional programs, right? So we, especially in, in places like Boston and there's other areas that are uh, neighboring states because it helps with the time zone piece. So that's sort of where I would start is reaching out to programs in your area or even within the same um, essentially time zone and saying, hey, can we start a collaborative effort for a visiting professor program? Because it's sort of interesting, even here in Boston, We'll have visiting professors, you know how many institutions are here in Boston? There's like eight to 10 residency programs within miles of each other. 
and everybody's flying in their own visiting professor and having dinner at a different restaurant and no one else in the in in town gets to benefit from that professor so if we could start a discussion and say hey whenever we're bringing somebody in we're going to web exit to everybody in town and 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 vice versa i i think that collaboration in itself um you know uh, it, it increases impact for a single person now you don't even have to fly somebody in. You could just say, hey, we've arranged somebody virtually. Can they speak at all the institutions? So I think starting locally and maybe spreading that to regionally, if you've done a lot of um, programs right within your city, but just, and, and that way it helps with time zones in that piece. But that's the way I would start that communication. Yeah, and we did try this between, I think it was three or four different institutions and it actually worked very well. Um, I'm going to move to a talk from a question from the audience. Um, this comes from a anonymous person. Um, excellent talk, Dr. Huang. Um, our institution also has an IM tool to share cases. Um, it was developed primarily for curbside consults or to phone a friend, but it can be used to case sharing with residents. In the era of HIPAA, how do you balance case and knowledge sharing without getting into trouble with the privacy and the um, compliance police? So, uh, Dr. Jennifer, do you mind taking that one? Sure. Um, that's a great question. So thank you for posing it. Um, I think that HIPAA um, states that you should use, I believe it says, basically it says that you should use as little, as little patient health information as possible to achieve your goals, but it does acknowledge that education can be one of those goals. So I, I think that when in the reading room, um, I think it's acceptable to share with colleagues while promoting clinical care during that time. Um, and obviously it's a little bit different now since I think, you know, at least at our institution, we're a little bit more spread out. So there's fewer people that are physically in the same room. Although I do think that if you're on the same service, you know, that, that, that it still encompasses um, promoting patient care. Um, some alternatives to that are, um, I think Paxpin, I've used Paxpin a few times. It's a pretty great tool in terms of allowing you to, um, it still allows you to window and level um, when you download the, a series, so like a CT or an MR. Um, so there's a lot more functionality than just downloading an image. Um, there's, um, if, you, if there are other ways of downloading cases to your computer, um, I, I personally don't know them, but um, I think our PAC system in general has, it has a pretty simple and quick download tool that you basically just click and it automatically de-identifies the images and those can be uploaded into, um, straight into a presentation or um, shared with, you know, with uh, uh, one of your colleagues. Um, we actually also, are, my institution recently started a case conference um, that residents helped to prepare. Um, and we did it specifically for our night float cases, um, where we have um, each resident that's on night float will prepare two cases, and it's very quick. So it takes me about five minutes per case to prepare. It's just a few slides of so, the image. I, I think the question was more sort of the HIPAA and security. I know um, we use Trillium, which um, for messaging between, you know, we have various groups like, you know, body CT, outreach, et cetera. And they're on Trillium, which is um, okay for HIPAA. And I, actually I was thinking as you were talking that that would be a great way for us to have, we could, the residents could have a, a interesting case group and, put cases in there because you can put medical record numbers and things in. And is that kind of what you're doing in your program? Yeah, it's, it's pretty similar to that. Um, I think that within our chat function tool, that's also uh, a possibility is to, you know, create this group and have uh, interesting cases as well. Um, and then you can also create like a folder and share like interesting teaching files as well. Um, so that, that's kind of what we, what we use to, to help accommodate that. Thank you very much. Um, Sherry Jordan. Hi, Sherry. Glad to hear that you're on this, although I suspect you know it all. Um, and she has a question about audience response systems. Um, I wonder whether anybody can chip in and say what their favorite audience response system is. And she's also asking whether anybody uses Slido, which I've never heard of, I'm afraid. I'm ignorant there as audience response. Non-medical educators, it receives high marks. Um, I don't know, Judy, do you want to start with that? Audience response systems, what, what's your favorite? Yes, thank you. I have never heard of Slido, if that's how you say it. I've heard of many, but not that one. And I would say uh, my preferred one depends on the situation. 
for um, trainee lectures like residents or fellows, I've tended to use more of Poll Everywhere. I have used um, RSNA Diagnosis Live for specific society talks, and that has been effective. And I mentioned Kahoot because one of probably everyone's favorite radiologists, uh, Stefan Tigges, uses Kahoot in his anatomy lectures with medical students. And if you are in person in a large group post pandemic, it can be very fun. As uh, Dr. Gupta had mentioned, it creates a lot of team and you know a lot of camaraderie when people are trying to play for points and it's more of a game, but I think it depends on the situation. If I had to choose, pull everywhere. Harp, do you have any preference? I know that you've used a whole bunch of them. Yeah, I actually, I like poll everywhere too. I think it's, you know, the, the fact that it has clickable images, uh, I think is especially nice for radiology in that way. Sort of device agnostic, free for up to, I think it's 40 users. Uh, I think it's just got more versatility in the types of questions you can ask. Um, in that way. So I, I sort of prefer that uh, at this point. Um, any of the residents have any preference? Jennifer or, or Yasha, anything that you really like using as, as the end users? Yeah, I agree. I think that Kahoot is definitely more fun with your peers. I think you can still do it on Zoom, um, but it's more fun when you do it with people that you know. If it's more like a general audience that you may not know, I think Poll Everywhere or um, just a Zoom function, like the, the Zoom poll is probably more effective, but Kahoot is definitely more fun with people you know because you're competing directly with them. So um, my attitude to this, I, I mean, I've used pretty much everything at some point or another. I've used Nearpod, I've used Poll Everywhere. Um, I like Diagnosis Live a lot because it's extremely stable. It's very easy to use. I do find Poll Everywhere is a little bit clumsy to use. There's, there's much more of a, a, a tough learning curve for me to teach faculty. Um, I like having clickable images, which isn't available in Kahoot and isn't available in a lot of the other um, functions. So, um, you know, and I, I like things that aren't going to crash on you and that people don't have to download some specific app, which but both Diagnosis Live and Poll Everywhere, you don't have to, you know, download the app uh, before they come. Um, I've done, I've used Diagnosis Live with multiple institutions across the country and in fact across the world, and it doesn't have a number limit. So that's been really good when I'm doing it with the whole medical school and things. Um, if you're just doing it with the, with the program and you're under 40, then most of them work pretty well. So you have to sort of play around a bit. It gets a little confusing for residents if you keep, you know, everybody uses something different in the department. Um, Nina Terry has just commented here about, in reference to our last comment about HIPAA, that um, you should check with your IT section um, to make sure which programs are HIPAA compliant and that you can use for things like case sharing. Um, Nina, do you have some questions you'd like to ask? Yes, I, um, I would like to ask the following question. And this is a question for some of the audience that we may have who are not at large, well-resourced academic institution. And uh, perhaps Dr. Gaddy could answer the question or anyone. Um, what advice do you have with, with this plethora of um, IT, uh, um, um, mechanisms that we have. Uh, what advice do you have for places that don't have all that much, who are out there working with not a lot of IT support? Yes, thank you. So in regards to places who have less IT support and resources, I think a lot of the things that we've talked about in this hour are very manageable and accessible even without having many resources because a lot of the things we're talking about are free. So, um, you know, Zoom, WebEx, all of those have limits up to, how, you know, different limits of how many participants. So it depends on your group. And then again, things like Poll Everywhere, Kahoot, the audience response, those will vary depending on um, audience size, but pretty much are free to a certain degree. And um, then in regards to the actual curriculum and trying to use the resources that are out there, 
again, many of the societies, like I showed you the ASNR, um, and I'm sure many other non-neuroradiology societies have their own curriculum. And I think the pandemic has helped them develop more of a curriculum and specify specific lectures or articles to read. And those are available to members. Anyone else have any suggestions or questions about that? I mean, I think you have to hunt around a little bit. I mean, like, you know, we're talking about the audience response. They can vary from being extremely expensive to free. I guess that's the other way around, to be free to <laughs> extremely expensive. Um, but, you know, most of them, you can get something very decent for, you know, $200 a year or something. And, you know, in the end, that's not a huge impact on the educational budget. Um, I use Nearpod a whole lot, which is actually quite a, a nice system um, and allows a whole variety of question choices. And I think that was a, a couple of hundred dollars and most of the curricula are free. Um, MRI Online has a resident, their resident curriculums all free. Um, the, some of their others are subscription and a lot more expensive. You know, the one thing I'll say is there's a lot of content. There's, there's one point I want to definitely reinforce here. There's a tremendous amount of content and you can totally get lost in the abyss here. Um, the most important thing I think we can do for our trainees is to curate that content for them, assign it to them, and have a structured format where we're checking their understanding of that content. There's got to be structure in the residency space. You can't just say, okay, um, there are, here's three lectures. Can you watch these three lectures this week and then never speak of them again? There has to be a follow up to that. There has to be, okay, well, let's sit down on Thursday and we're going to go over these talks together to see what your level of understanding is. So we're talking a lot about technology tools, this, that, and the other. Um, it's, it's just engagement and it's, it's communication and you don't need tech to do a lot of this to add emotion and energy to a, a session that you're with the learners. Um, you just need to engage yourself with them. And we, even without the technology, you can create an experience that they will remember. So uh, I, I, the one thing I really wanna stress is you have to have structure. If you're gonna assign them offline learning, or uh, you know, uh, independent learning, you gotta follow up with that in a structured way. Yeah, I completely agree with you, Harp. And you know, also if you, you give that structure to your residents that we will be talking about this on Thursday and this is Tuesday, it will get done. If you leave it open-ended, yeah, maybe it will, maybe it won't get done. Yeah, it's, wow. interesting. it's interesting because I've done this many times. I've asked uh, a resident to do give it uh to listen to a talk and i've said on thursday and then invariably thursday comes up and i'm getting crushed in the neural list or whatever the case is and before the day is over invariably that resident will walk up to me and say dr Beatty, uh i i watched that video that you asked me to watch i was hoping we could go over it yeah because i've done it and they and they want to follow up with that they want to have that moment of you know i i did it you asked me to do it and let's just you know let's have this a few minutes to talk about it so um, you know, it's, it's incumbent upon us to, to have that follow up with them. And I'm sure that Jennifer from her med ed background will completely agree that, you know, this repetition and consolidation is so important to really get that information into our learners. My husband's yeah, trying I completely to laugh agree. By wearing a funny hat over there. <laughs> Thank you, dear. Um, all right, so let's see how we're doing with the time here. I think we are at time. Um, Laurie, would you like to just have a few closing remarks and then we'll let everyone have their evening activities? Absolutely, and I would love to keep the conversation going. It's a great conversation. Um, so thank you to all of our speakers, our moderators, our ACR staff. Um, and to you, our audience um, for joining us tonight. I um, wanted you to know that we are recording this and it will be available through the ACR, through social media. Um, and the last thing that I kind of wanted to say was, um, I think we should be proud of how we've come together 
as a community of educators and we've shared, we've learned, we've created <laughs> together and um, especially the sharing part. I think that's really important. And I'm excited to see how, what things we do together as we move forward into thriving mode. <laughs> So thank you, everybody, and have a good evening. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, and take care. Thank you. Thank Great you. job.